Hello everyone, my name's Liz and I'm a part-time academic in the School of Architecture, Construction and Environment. The school where I work is part of the Welsh Institute of Science and Art within the University of Wales, Trinity St David, and we're based in Swansea in Wales in the UK. That's a bit of a mouthful to speak, isn't it? And on the top of that role, I'm also the communications lead for impact and engagement for QUIC, the Construction Wales Innovation Centre at the university. In a nutshell, that means I eat, breathe and sleep in my chosen subject of architecture. I mean, I even named my dog after an architect. Latin. You're probably wondering why I'm in the science slam at Eurovision. Well, I've been a fan of the Eurovision Song Contest for years and I'm British. That could be a bit of a paradox when it comes to songs and scoring, culture and celebration, music and mayhem. But indulge me a little and let me take you beyond all of that. There hasn't been any research into the relationship between architecture and Eurovision. So the topic is ripe for investigation, which is where I've started and how I'm now part of the Science Slam this year. Now, you're probably thinking that the most obvious architecture for Eurovision is the actual venue itself. So let's start there. The UK have hosted the contest the most times, not because they've necessarily won it the most times, but because they've stood in for other countries over the years. But it's difficult to see any kind of pattern of influence from Eurovision on the architecture of the UK, because the UK has hosted it in eight different locations. This includes the Circular Donut of BBC Television Centre in West London in 1963, the Art Deco and Grade 1 listed Brighton Dome in 1974, and the modern Liverpool Arena just last year. That was designed by Wilkinson Air Architects, and Liverpool Arena was part of the regeneration of the Liverpool City region in 2008. A better case study would be to look at Ireland, who has hosted the contest seven times, mostly in Dublin and mostly at the Point Theatre. Taking its name from its previous use as a train depot, which served the port, it was renovated into a theatre in the late 1980s. A really interesting fact I discovered was that U2 recorded some of their 1988 Rattle and Hum album there before it was formally opened. And The Point hosted the Eurovision Song Contest three times in the 1990s, and it was the location that launched Riverdance, the famous interval act from 1994 that then went on to global success. So my research is going to look in depth at the urban development of Dublin and how investment for Eurovision has changed the built environment landscape. The hosting of this year's contest by Malmo means that Sweden will equal Ireland's record of hosting the contest on seven occasions, with Malmo Arena hosting it twice. Like the UK, Sweden have used five different venues to host the contest, so a look at the development of the Swedish townscape will also be considered as a case study for the research. The Netherlands have also hosted the contest at a variety of venues over the years, so a closer look at the cities there who did so will be considered as the third case study for this strand of the research. I'm going to look now at the second strand of my research, the postcards which were introduced to the contest in 1970. These short films typically showcase the personal or professional life of the artist, along with scenic views and a glimpse of their homeland, or introduce locations of the host with a nod to their own country of origin. Who can forget Dana running over the Haitney Bridge over the River Lippi in Dublin in 1970, or the Azerbaijan artist Samra roller skating outside Zaha Hadid's concert hall in Baku for the 2016 postcards? The post-COVID world of Eurovision in 2021 meant that several acts could not film their postcards in the host country of the Netherlands, so the concept had to change. RTV used, used a neon house outline at various Dutch locations from which, magically, the artists would appear. The artists, meanwhile, filmed themselves on a green screen studio in their homeland, and technology magically, seamlessly, brought these two parts together. The Dutch regional television network asked the public for location ideas. They submitted an overwhelming number of responses with more than 400 unique locations, including the 15th century Koppel Port and the former chapel of the Hofkapel in The Hague and the High Bridge in Maastricht, which was designed by René Greisch in 2003. 
I'm really looking forward to watching all the postcards from all the contests over the years to identify the buildings in each and draw some insightful conclusions, such as, does a popular building equal a favourite act to win? The third strand of my research is analysis of the backdrops used in the scoring process. Typically, the representative of the jury opts for a notable and often floodlit structure as their background, which does help the viewers in identifying the country from which they're giving the scores. On more than one occasion, the French jury representative has had a floodlit Eiffel Tower behind them. Built for the Paris World Fair in 1889, the landmark Eiffel Tower was the tallest building in the world when it was built and remained so for 40 years. When giving the jury scores for Australia in 2016 and 2017, the jury representative had a backdrop of the Sydney Opera House. This is a building from which the architect resigned in 1966 after relations with a client broke down and the engineer had to finish the job. Like the Eiffel Tower, the Sydney Opera House represents innovation in architecture and engineering and also provides the space to realise creative ambition. An aspiration similar, perhaps, to all of the acts and venues at Eurovision. Hopefully I've shown you how architecture can subconsciously enter the mind of every Eurovision participant on every level. Design, ambition, inspiration, memorable, iconic, these are all words that can be equally applied to both architecture and Eurovision. And this is only the beginning of the journey for me. I have many happy hours ahead watching past contests, picking out the buildings and drawing my conclusions. So watch this space and wish me luck.